this is the first of a two video series which I prepare for you on the King's Indian Defence. And together the two videos form a complete repertoire for black in this opening. Now the King's Indian Defence has been one of my favourite openings, despite the enormous body of theory that is built up around several critical lines, because of the variety of choice at black's disposal. Hence I've carefully selected dynamic modern lines for you, which give black dangerous attacking opportunities. On this tape, we'll first of all consider the Samish variation, then we'll go on to consider the Four Pawns attack, and finally, we'll consider the insidious Fianchetto lines where white plays G3. The Samish variation is introduced by the move 5F3, and it's one of white's most popular ideas against the King's Indian defence. In this video, we're going to examine an original idea which I had and tried in correspondence chess against a Russian player in the semi-final of the World Championship. This idea starts with the move 5b6. Now actually this idea is hardly used and has hardly been used in the past but I think the move is quite playable. The system with 5b6 can't be compared with the analogous system if we just retract the pawn to b7 castles, bishop e3, b6, although the positions look quite similar, because I think black gains in flexibility for not having castled. We're now going to follow the game Lukmanov martin from the semi-final of the World Correspondence Championship, 1993. And in this game, my Russian opponent played bishop e3. Well, this is quite normal in the same -ish variation because actually white's setup is geared to a kingside attack. For instance, he may play just queen d2 and then violent moves such as h4, g4, h5 with a traditional kingside attack. This can be especially effective if black has castled early. Now the main idea behind black's system is not to castle early, in fact to wait a little while for white to reveal his hand. Instead of bishop e3, bishop d3 was supposed to give white the advantage. For instance, bishop b7, knight g2, c5, d5, knight bd7, castles, knight e5, and now f4. When knight takes d3, queen takes d3, gives white a big spatial edge, and white's plan of bishop d2 and rook a e1, leading up to the advance e4, e5, is difficult to meet. Another variation illustrating white's supposedly good chances after bishop d3 is e5, d5, knight h5, knight g e2, black castles, and white just develops sensibly with bishop e3, knight d7, queen d2, a5, black is trying to cement the position of a knight on c5 without being worried by the pawn advance b4, Bishop c2 by white, knight c5, and now in the game Ray versus Stein, Amsterdam 1969, white boldly grabbed a pawn with g4, knight f4, this is a regulation pawn sacrifice by black, it's just that, just that here I don't think black's got enough for the pawn, knight takes f4, e takes f4, Bishop takes f4. Advantage to white, in my opinion. So, assessing the information, I intended knight bd7, which I think is an improvement. Black keeps his bishop on c8 and intends c7, c5, or e7, e5, according to circumstances. I think knight bd7 is an excellent waiting move here. 
A typical line might be 7 bishop e3, now comes c5, d5, knight e5, and if white plays knight e2, then e6. And in comparison with the two lines we've just looked at, black's wirehead of both of them in terms of counterplay. He's ready to take white's bishop on d3, and he can also consider capturing simply the pawn on d5, when his bishop stands quite well on c8, with a position not dissimilar to a modern Bononi. Here I think black stands well, at least that's what I was going to do. So back at the game, Luke off martin my Russian opponent played bishop e3, the most natural move on the board really. Then black played bishop b7. Now actually, bishop b7 is the move which puts most black players off the double fianchetto. The reason being that if white ever gets around to playing d4, d5 at the right moment, then you can see the bishop on b7 is getting throttled. I wasn't too worried about that, because as long as black waits with castling, he hangs around in the centre for a little while, making good flexible waiting moves, then it shouldn't matter too much that the bishop's on b7. You'll see what I mean as the game goes on. White played queen d2. And black now played c5, actually inviting white to block the centre with d5. Which, of course, white did. And I think that's the best move. Then came knight bd7. And white played h4. Now, because this was such a new position, I didn't really know what white was going to play in this position. Obviously, he's got a wide choice of moves. Instead of h4, I considered that bishop d3 was a likely candidate move, after which I intended knight e5. If white were now to play the blunder, f4, I don't think black would take the bishop on d3 with check, which is rather similar to a, an early example we just looked at. But instead, knight e g4 is a good move profiting from the fact that white hasn't moved the knight on g1. I think it's important, if white allows, to get rid of this bishop on e3. Then the bishop on g7 becomes a very strong piece. So in fact in the game, white played h4, and black played another useful waiting move, a6. Just a modest move, but the point is that if white ever castles on the queen side, then there's going to be an immediate reception committee waiting for him with b5. They will be quite happy to sacrifice the pawn here, even with his king in the centre. Added to which, the pawn on a6 covers the b5 square. This is also quite important, as you'll see. Now Lukmanov played a strong move, I think. Knight h3. The point of this move is to come to f2 with the knight, which in turn supports the e4 pawn and also supports the advance g4 followed possibly by h5 and g5. Now what black's got to be very careful in this position after knight h3 that he doesn't prematurely castle. He must continue to wait around in the centre. I think I played a strong move here, knight e5. Now possibly we see the drawback of the move h4, in that probably in this type of position white wants to play f3, f4. But as you can now see, the knight's ready on e5 to hop into g4, an unassailable square. White played another strong move now. He played bishop e2, which actually creates a direct threat. And that threat is g4, followed by g5, followed by f4, which if allowed would just push black off the board. White would gain a tremendous control of space, should that happen. So after bishop e2, I played h5, keeping control over g4. White played knight f2. Maybe that's not the best. 
Now, around here, Lukmanov had to start making difficult decisions, so I was well satisfied with that. In fact, Black's position looked passive, and, I don't know, it's difficult to see what Black's going to do, but Black is actually waiting for White to reveal his hand. And, in fact, Black's position is extremely difficult to crack. The more so that if White plays for the move f3, f4, he leaves the g4 square exposed. Now, it's very difficult to put concrete variations to this position because both players are still manoeuvring. But if White gets too ambitious, the resilience of Black's game is surprising. For instance, if we put the knight back on h3, let's give White the move knight g5, which looks logical and aggressive here. And then I was intending bishop c8. Very strange move. For instance, rook b1. These were just variations I analysed at the time. In fact, White's been held up so much so on the king side, he's got to now turn to the queen side if he wants to put pressure on Black's position. Hence, rook b1. And now, b5. A takes b5. A takes b5, so this is a pawn sacrifice. Bishop takes b5 check. Bishop d7. Bishop e2. Actually, it was quite important, I think, not to take the bishop on d7, because that would leave the c4 square exposed. So I thought bishop e2, and then queen a5. a3. And now black castles. Black's waited around to the right moment. Typical Benko gambit pressure coming up with rook f b8. In fact, this is quite a lousy Benko for white because he's so weak on the king side. So I, I estimated this position is better for black, despite the fact that he's pawned down. So another variation after knight g5, bishop c8. Let's, just, let's give white the move a3. Again, trying to crack black open with, with b4. Then comes bishop d7 b4 by white. Then I thought queen c7, attacking the c4 pawn indirectly. b takes c5, b takes c5, rook b1, and now I think black simply castles, leaving white wondering why he's got this pawn on h4. I think this position is better for black actually. Now, after bishop c8, Lukmanov played bishop f4. And it was becoming clear to me at this stage that he didn't really know what to do. He didn't really understand how to meet Black's cagey idea. I wonder whether white really is threatening bishop takes e5 here, followed by g4. I couldn't really believe it, and I'll tell you why. I played rook a7 and more, more or less inviting white to take the knight if he wished. And I analysed the following variation. Bishop takes e5, d takes e5, knight c d1, bishop h6, bringing black's bishop into play, knight e3, castles, knight d3, and then just queen c7. And I thought black had a good game here. I mean, this bishop on h6 is very strong. Although you understand it's a very difficult position to evaluate, I don't think black has any problems here. So I was quite happy if, if Lukmanov had taken the knight on e5. He didn't do that. Actually, it's probably quite frustrating for white. I mean, here he is, all souped up and ready to roll on the king side. He's waiting for black to castle, and then he'll try and mate him. And black's simply not castling. He's making all manner of functional waiting moves. Well, White castled on the queen side, lost a bit of patience. And Black played knight fd7. I wasn't going to give him the second chance to take that knight anymore. And White plays king b1. Right now, having waited for so long, I decided that White having committed himself, and this is the whole point of Black's system, just to wait for White to commit himself, I mean, in a sense, h4 committed White, casting on the queen side commits him even more. I decided to try and start an attack. 
Black played b5. It's very surprising Black can attack from this position, but in fact he, he can initiate a very violent attack here, as you'll see. Well, after b5, the pace picks up a bit. White played c takes b5. And now, having shuffled around for so long, Black's attack was remarkably quick to appear with queen a5. Suddenly you see the pressure beginning to, to mount. White played rook c1. The point of this will be revealed a little later on. And black played a takes b5. Bishop takes b5. And then black's bishop went to a6. So what has happened here really is we've got a kind of Benko gambit position. Where white has actually castled on the queen side directly into black's attack. Well, the point of rook c1 was now revealed. He played bishop takes a6, queen takes a6, and now b3. So the rook on c1 gives the knight on c3 welcome added protection against the power of the bishop on g7. But again, black's next move is not unexpected. Black castled on the king's side. Well, despite the fact white's a pawn up, I really wouldn't like to be white in this position because, as you can see, the rook on f8 is threatening to swing across to b8 or a8 and the pressure will just then mount. Actually, I believe black almost has a winning game right here in this position, but it needs to be proven. Well, white tried to get black's bishop off the board, bishop h6. But black's next move probably dumbfounded him. Knight c4. Now it was possible to calculate the following variation here. B takes c4. Rook b8 check. Knight b5. Rook takes b5 check. C takes b5. Queen takes b5 check. King c2, bishop takes h6, queen takes h6, rook takes a2 check, king c3, the king goes backwards to d1, then queen e2 is the end. So king c3, queen b4 check, king d3, queen d4 mate. So after knight c4, white tried to improve with pawn takes knight, rook b8 check, king a1. And now came the whole point of black's play, bishop h8. Actually I consider this to be one of the best moves I've ever played, because it's a killer. A clear piece down, black makes a quiet move, challenging white to find a defence. The most violent threat is just simply to take on c4 with the queen, intending bishop takes c3 check, rook takes c3, rook takes a2, and white gets mated. If white finds a defence against this threat, then there's the backup threat of knight e5, and just simply knight takes c4, followed by Rook b2, and again, imminent mate. The difficulty for white lies in his pin knight at c3. It's very difficult to, to beat off the black attack here. Lukmanov tried knight f d1. But the problem with this move is that it blocks up his rooks. Black played rook a b7. Rook e1 by white. And now came the move knight e5. And believe it or not, in this position, white resigned. Now it's a fairly enigmatic resignation, but in fact, black is threatening all sorts of nasty things. For instance, white plays knight e3, trying to shore up c4. And now the crushing move, rook b2, with. Queen takes b2, 
Rook takes b2. King takes b2. Knight d3 check. King c2. Knight takes e1 check. If it was simply a matter of one white rook going, then I think white would probably be okay. At least he could play on. But rook takes e1. Bishop takes c3. I think you can probably see it now. King takes c3. And then queen a5 check. Picking up a second white rook. When the bishop and knight are no match for the queen at all. To sum up, I think the variation with 5b6 is evasive and interesting. It's a counter-attacking system. Black often doesn't play bishop b7 even. He's waiting a little bit for white to reveal his hand. Usually, black will play the knight to d7, and he will usually play c5. Again, usually, I say usually because there's hardly any information on this system, very few games, if any, that I know of. Usually, black's knight will come into e5, and then he'll adjust his counterplay as appropriate. I think this setup will work very well against impatient white players, particularly those who are hell bent on a king side attack, because you wait in the centre with your king. This is another very important aspect of black's position. You wait in the centre with your king for a little while. It's not out of the question that you can castle long in this position. It, it is perfectly possible if white starts overextending. So I believe this is a very interesting method against the sameish variation, and one which you should employ with confidence. Good luck. The four pawns attack is initiated when white plays the move 5f4, reaching the following position. There you can see white's pawns in a line, and he hopes to overrun black with the pawns in the middle game, or at the very least, cramp black with these pawns, denying the black pieces space. On this video, I'm going to propose a counter-attacking line for black, very similar to the Benko Gambit. And it goes as follows. Black castles. White plays knight f3. This is the main line. And now the immediate c5. Now by far the most common move for white in this position is the advance d5. But we should see what happens if white plays the rare d takes c5. In my opinion this doesn't really present black with too many problems, providing he remembers to play the immediate queen a5. So black threatens to take on c5 with the queen and at the same time he threatens Knight takes the e4 pawn, which would be crushing if white were to allow this move. So play continues, bishop d3 by white, and now queen takes c5. Now the key to white's idea lies in his next move, that's queen e2. What he hopes is that by playing bishop e3, and the queen on e2 supports the bishop on e3, the black queen will be driven away, and white will gain some time. However, knight c6 is a good move, and if bishop e3, then black shouldn't be too worried about it, just play queen a5. For instance, castles on the king side, bishop g4, h3, bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, and then knight to d7. And in this position, I believe black has equality. The point being that the c3 knight is threatened. If the knight comes into d5, then not only does b2 hang, but black can get rid of the knight straight away with e6 if he so desires. And if the knight doesn't come into d5, and white manages to protect his knight, let's say with bishop d2, then black has a nice outpost on d4 for his pieces. Either knight d4, or bishop d4 check, or maybe even just quietly with knight c5. 
With this careful exchange of bishop for knight on f3, followed by knight d7, targeting the d4 square, black gets a good game. Back now to the position where black has just played c5, and white pushes on d5, reaching the mainline position. Now I'm going to recommend the move b5 for black. I think black can afford to be aggressive in this position simply because he has castled and white has some way to go before castling. And now white has to decide what to do. Well, in terms of frequency, he nearly almost always accepts the pawn, not with knight takes b5, because then the pawn at e4 is hanging, but c takes b5, and then black goes on gambiting a pawn with a6. And now we reach an important parting of the ways. Now the first variation I want to look at is the acceptance of black's gambit pawn with b takes a6. It takes a very courageous white player to accept this gambit pawn because black does not now play bishop takes a6 when I think white escapes relatively unscathed with for instance bishop takes a6, bishop takes a6 and now however black recaptures white will castle with a reasonably comfortable game. But if we retract, then queen a5 is an excellent move. There are several threats. Firstly, black gives himself the option of taking back on a6 with either bishop or knight. He threatens immediately, knight takes e4. And if white defends against that threat, Let's say white goes through the same sequence as before. This time we'll flick in bishop d2. Bishop takes a6. Bishop takes a6. Then black captures back on a6 with the queen. Again, keeping the white king in the middle for some time. We'll see how this all works out as we go on with the analysis. Returning to the position after queen a5, white almost always in this position plays bishop d2. Now the obvious move is bishop takes a6 and we're going to see this move employed in the game Zilberbird versus Gufeld, Los Angeles 1987. As an alternative to bishop takes a6 in the game Herzog Zinzikashvili, St Martin 1991, black played knight bd7 presumably hoping that white would move the bishop on f1 when black gains a tempo by taking on a6 with the bishop. Herzog tried queen c2 and only now did Zinzikashvili take the pawn, bishop takes a6. Herzog tried knight b5, hitting black's queen, but after queen b6, a4, c4, Bishop takes c4, knight g4, black had compensation. However, all this might not strictly be necessary as we return to the good move, bishop takes a6. So now, in the game, Zilberberg Gufeld, after bishop d2, black play bishop takes a6. And Zilberberg took the bishop. Bishop takes a6. If instead white plays bishop e2, then in Kozel Kochayev, Palmer 1989, black got compensation with queen b4, attacking e4 and b2, e5, d takes e5 f takes e5, knight g4, bishop takes a6, knight takes a6, with a very murky and unclear situation. Don't forget white's e-pawn is hanging and he is yet to castle. Returning to Zilberberg Gufeld, white has just taken the bishop on a6 and now an important recapture with the queen, queen takes a6. And white tried queen e2. 
Now, the main point of this position is that blacks shouldn't be too worried about the exchange of queens. It's a well-known theme in the, the Benko positions that if the queens come off, white's pawns on b2 and a2 become very weak. Added to which, it's difficult to see a satisfactory home for the white king in this type of position. Now, actually, black could just take the queens off if he so desires in this position, or he could play knight bd7, as in the game Karasov Vashikov, Leningrad 1974. But I think Gufel wanted to recapture an a6 with the knight here because he played knight f to d7, and he gives this move an exclamation mark in his notes. White took the queen. Black recaptured with a knight, and white played king e2. Knight b6. Right, so black's threatening an intrusion on c4, so white's next move is understandable. He played b3. And now a strong move by black, f5. Now this really disrupts a white centre which looked unshakable not so long ago. In fact, it destroys the white centre. And then, after the centre has been destroyed, what about the position of white's king? Isn't it rather precarious there on e2? Very difficult for, for white to find a good move here. For instance, if he plays e5, then knight b4 is strong, putting pressure on the exposed pawn on d5. So, there came knight g5, which looks logical enough, coming into the e6 square. And black played f takes e4. Then came knight e6. If, instead of that move, white had played knight g takes e4, then comes knight b4, with a familiar annexation of the d-pawn. Gufeld had a good answer to knight e6. He played bishop takes knight on c3. And after bishop takes c3, rook f5. Another very strong move, concentrating on this weak white pawn at d5. In fact, that pawn is now a goner. Well, already the position is desperate for white, actually. It's, it's quite amazing. His king's stuck in the centre, and the d-pawn's going after which the white king is actually going to come under a tremendous attack. The knight on e6 looks very strong, but actually he's got to get out of there pretty quickly, otherwise he's going to be surrounded and even taken off. So clear advantage to black after rook f5. g4 by white, and then rook takes d5. And white played f5, trying desperately to open up the king's side and start an attack against the black king rather hopeful in this current position, I would say. Right, rook d3 by black. Not only hitting the bishop, but then the knight on b6 comes thundering into the game on d5. This looks tremendously strong for black. White defended the bishop, rook ac1, but then knight d5, hitting the bishop again. Bishop grovels back to a1, and then a tremendous move, knight a to b4 bringing the remaining black pieces into the game. Now look at that rook bearing down on the poor a2 pawn, and the knight enters the game. And once white plays a4, which is more or less forced, then b3 hangs, the knight on b4 is invulnerable. All these things mean that black is, has a totally one position. So Zilberg tried a4, but then rook takes b3, not so surprising. f takes g6. Rook takes a4, tremendous stuff by black. G takes h7, king takes h7, rook hd1, and then knight a2, rook c2, and then knight a c3 check, winning all of white's pieces. White resigned. We're back now at the position where black's just played a6. And if you recall, we're looking at the line where white takes the pawn on a6. Now, my overall impression of this line is it's not very good for white. I think white's made far too many poor moves already to justify making two further poor moves, grabbing, you know, black's offer. I think after queen a5, 
the capture on A6 with the bishop and a subsequent recapture on A6 with the queen, then black has more than a comfortable game. In fact, the game silverberg gufeld is so crushing for black that it's, it's a real passion killer from white's point of view. I don't like this variation for white at all. White should not take that pawn on A6. But a lot of your opponents might. Now, the best move for white after A6 is supposed to be A4. And in fact, it's A4 which gives the, the line with B5 a rather dubious theoretical status. But I believe that black can get a good game after A4, and I'll show you how. Now, normally, in this position, black plays queen A5. This is not such a bad move, but I believe the very best move for black here is not queen A5, but E6. Now the point is to completely destroy the white centre. If black is going to capture on b5 at any point, he's going to wait until white moves the bishop on f1. So this looks like a good moment to take some action in the centre of the board. We'll now follow the game Piskov versus Vashikov, Moscow Championship 1987. After e6, white played bishop e2. Now, as we said, when white moves his bishop, it's time to take on b5. So black played a takes b5. And then comes bishop takes b5. And then e takes d5 by black. The point is that after e takes d5 by white, I think black goes bishop a6 here with quite good compensation. For instance, white castles... Black takes on b5 with the bishop, knight takes b5, and now knight e4, with an excellent game. The plan, if allowed, is rook e8, or black might play f5, or we can also consider just knight d7 and knight f6, or maybe knight d7 and knight b6. That knight on e4, combined with the bishop on g7, powering down the diagonal to b2, gives black excellent compensation. And don't forget, white's pawn on d5 is quite weak here. I believe black has more than enough for a pawn in this sort of situation. So back at the game piskov fasikov after e takes d5 by black, white went e5. Black played d takes e5, f takes e5, and now a slightly surprising move, probably a mistake, black played knight e4. Personally, I find knight g4 a better move. The point being that if white captures on d5 now, for instance with queen takes d5, then I think black can play queen takes d5, knight takes d5, here are just a few thoughts of my own to illustrate the possibilities. Black takes on e5 with a knight. And then white should probably take this knight, drawing black's bishop out into the open board. Bishop takes e5. The drawback of this idea from white's point of view is it gives black this wonderful square, bishop d4. And now there are several moves for white, none of which I think give black too much hassle. The most obvious of these moves is bishop h6. But then I think black simply responds rook d8. If white follows up this move with either rook d1 or even castles on the queen side, then black's response will be bishop d4. If white comes in and takes the bishop, with knight e7 check, king h8, knight takes c8, then black takes back, rook takes c8, and he's prepared to play knight c6, and if allowed, knight d4, or possibly knight b4. Black can always answer an attack against f7, with f7, f5. And he may, at some point, decide to cover the 7th rank 
with, for instance, rook a7. So all these possibilities give black an adequate game, in my opinion, after bishop h6. So instead of bishop h6, what happens if white simply castles on the king side? Looks like a good move. Well then, I believe black can exploit the fact that the bishop on e5 protects the vulnerable c7 square, and black should play just simply bishop e6, hitting the knight. If white plays knight b6, then rook a7 is fine. If bishop c4, then I think knight c6 is adequate, with familiar penetration to either d4 or b4 as appropriate. White's a pawn, although it looks quite strong at present, can turn out to be weak under the gaze of black's rook on a8. Back at the position after e6, white can try queen b3. Then I think black's idea of opening the centre is revealed to its best advantage. Black will play e takes d5. Now if knight takes d5, then the pawn of d4 hangs. So e takes d5. Then black plays rook e8 check. And after bishop e2, the cunning move, the excellent move, knight e4. Now it's difficult for white to play a decent move here. I think he's probably got to take that knight. And when he does take the knight, knight takes knight, rook takes knight. Obviously white's under pressure. He can't castle, the bishop e2 hangs. White's got to resolve the, the uh, precarious position of that bishop. And also, black threatens maybe to double up on the e-file with, for instance, queen e7. There's a nice square on b4 for the rook, if necessary. For instance, if rook b4 straight away, then probably black is just threatening a takes b5. So all in all, after knight e4 and the capture on e4 with the rook, the recapture, I think black has an excellent position. That's the sort of thing he's aiming for when he plays e6. To take on d5, then give that check. So to sum up, against the theoretically recommended a4, I think you should play e6, trying to blow open the centre. You threaten to take on d5, and when the e-file opens up, to give a check with the rook on e8. The final move for white worth considering in this section, after e6, is the capture d takes e6. I believe that black should now recapture with the bishop. This hasn't been played very often, presumably because white players don't like developing black's pieces. For instance, if white plays f5 now, I think black simply takes that pawn, g takes f5. Although that looks horrible, black can play a capture like that because it takes white some time to get his king out of the middle. And for instance, after e takes f5, bishop takes f5, black's already threatening the annoying check, rook e8. Although black's king position is possibly weaker than it might be at this stage of the game, white's king position is also very precarious and it demands constant attention. I don't think a continuation like that should worry black at all. Black has the initiative. Now back to bishop takes e6. And I'll give you just a sample line because this hasn't been played before in a grandmaster game to my knowledge in any game that, that I could find. And so I'm on my own, I'm giving you my own analysis here. Let's assume white plays bishop e2 to get castled. Now the instant that bishop moves, black should take on b5. Bishop takes b5. And now one move among many is knight a6, with the intention of putting the knight in on b4. Let's give white castling, and then black plays knight b4. Again, white plays bishop d2 and then I think queen b6, threatening maybe to go c4 check. So white plays king h1, and then c4 anyway. With some pressure for black, I mean black threatens to bring the knight into d3, and maybe to f2, maybe it would bring the other knight in, knight g4, 
and again with pressure on this time both E3 and F2. Now that was just an example but it's an illustration of the type of initiative Black can work up in the E6 line. And let's, let's be honest, White wasn't particularly careless in this example, he just played normal developing moves. The final move for White, only very recently played, is Queen B3. This move was played in the game Jerome Piquet against Alexis Shirov, Aruba 1995, and is completely new. White's trying to reinforce the pawn on B5, and maybe he threatens to push the pawn to B6, and follow up with a quick A4, A5. If White can cement that pawn in on B6, then Black will surely be lost. So Black's got to fight against this plan very quickly. Now Shirov played in the game, Queen B6. But if you don't like that move, there is a hair-raising alternative. Which is, instead of Queen B6, 9 E6. And the idea, after B6 by White, is to play the crazy move, Bishop B7. With the following continuation. D takes E6. Knight takes E4. E takes F7 check. King H8. Now I rather like this position for black. I like his tremendous advantage in development and the fact that the white king is still stuck in the middle. Of course in this position black is two pawns down. But on the other hand the pawn on F7 can't really remain on the board for very long. And black may well have his own share of the, the game. For instance, if white plays bishop c4, then maybe knight takes c3, b takes c3, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and queen h4 check. To be quickly followed by knight d7, connecting the rooks. Surely black must have a dangerous initiative here. Back to the game P.K. Shirov, where we left Shirov playing Queen B6. And P.K. played A4. Now, if A4 was dangerous before, it's doubly dangerous here, because White's threat of A5 will hit the black queen, queen moves away, wherever, let's say, B7, and then White pushes on with B6, throttling black. That B pawn is a winner. So black must be on his guard, right here. After A4, black played A takes B5, bishop takes B5, and now Shirov gives as best the move knight A6, intending knight B4, with a very unclear situation. Summing up, I think black should take the four pawns attack head on and meet it with the move 7b5. I think this move gives black the initiative and the Benko Gambit type positions that arise from it where black sacrifices a pawn to open the queen side files are difficult for white to meet now that he's loosened his position with pawn moves like f4 and e4. Despite being regarded as theoretically dubious in virtually every opening manual on the market I believe this variation is very much alive and kicking. The Fianchetto variation of the King's Indian is introduced by the following moves. White plays d4, knight f6, c4, g6, and then white plays the outwardly modest move, g3. Play goes on. Bishop g7, Bishop g2, black castles, and white plays knight f3, black plays d6, and white castles. And on this video, I'm going to recommend the system knight c6, knight c3, bishop f5. A couple of ideas behind the move. First and foremost, I think black tries to control the e4 square. You can see black's knight on f6 and the bishop on f5 prevent white from making his natural move 
E4. That's the first point. Should White find a way of forcing through E4, and we, we will see that he can do this, then Black's second point is that he wants to play either Queen D7 or Queen C8, backing up the bishop, followed by Bishop H3, eliminating White's dangerous Fiancetto bishop. This is another key idea in Black's system. There are several moves for White from this position, and we'll look at each in turn. The first of these is the plausible, but not very good move in my opinion, knight h4. I find this move rather vague. White well, puts a knight on the side, ok, black's not going to let him have the bishop on f5, and when black retreats with bishop d7, whilst black's bishop is on quite a coherent square, you may say even a good square, d7, one can hardly say the same for the poor knight on h4. A couple of grandmasters, particularly Victor Korchnoi, have tried this move, but they haven't really got anywhere. And I'll give you a couple of examples to prove it. For instance, the game korchnoi gufeld USSR Championship 1965. Korchnoi tried f4. Black went knight a5 attacking the pawn at c4 and after queen d3 played c5 white played d5 and then black played a6 white played b3 black went straight through with the move b5 white played bishop d2 rook b8 so whilst the white knight remains out of the game, out on a limb, on h4, black is consistently preparing pressure down the b-file. After rook b8, white played rook ac1, then came queen c7, and white tried to play in the centre with e4. After this there came pawn takes pawn, b takes c4, and then rook b2, with an excellent position for black. There are two other lines for white, after knight h4, bishop d7, neither of which promise any advantage. First, in the game Chong Gufeld, Cuba 1984, white tried e4, and black hit at the sensitive d4 square straight away by playing e5. I think this is a correct move. Chom pushed on with d5, and black played knight d4. Then came bishop e3, and black sacrificed a pawn here with c5, obtaining good play after d takes c6, b takes c6, bishop takes d4, e takes d4, queen takes d4, Knight d5. Finally, in Johansson Babotsov, Havana 1966, after knight h4, bishop d7, white tried a quieter move, b3. This type of play can't promise white too much. If he wanted to play b3, should have played it before he put the knight on h4, I think. Again, e5 is a clean equaliser. For instance, d takes e5, d takes e5, bishop b2 by white, and now black just plays simply, rook e8, knight d5, black took the knight, knight takes d5, c takes d5, knight e7, e4, and then black equalises the chances with c6. Black's plan, if allowed, is to take on d5 with a pawn, and then reroute his knight via c8 to d6. When he's in good shape, an f5 is firmly on the horizon. 
A second move for white, which you're going to consider, is the move 8h3. I think the main idea behind this is that white wants to stop black from playing queen c8, followed by bishop to h3, eliminating his bishop on g2. So he plans to answer queen c8 with simply king h2, and then he'll get on with preparing the advance e4, when the position of black's bishop might prove a little troublesome. Well now I believe the best move for black is knight e4, a simple equaliser. If white takes this knight, then bishop takes e4, and black is already putting white under pressure. There's a threat of bishop takes knight on f3, followed by something takes on d4. The pawn on h3 looks superfluous, and in fact, if allowed, black can target white's d pawn by, for instance, if white now plays bishop e3, then e6 followed by d5 will fix that d pawn down, and black can use it as an object of attack throughout the middle game. So, after knight e4, probably the best move for white is knight d5, refusing to exchange. And then in the game Vladimir of Borisenko, USSR 1957, black was able to maintain equality after bishop d7, bishop e3, e6, knight f4, knight e7, queen c2, knight f6, rook a d1, and then bishop c6. Black plans bishop e4, and then maybe d5, or the preparation of d5 by playing c6, and only then d5. A radical attempt at forcing through the move e4 by white is to play rook e1. And now we're going to follow the game Stoll versus G. Timoshenko, Slovensko, 1994. Black should certainly take steps to prevent e4, for at least a little while. And Timoshenko played knight e4. Now we've seen that taking on e4 doesn't lead to very much for white, so Stoll played knight d5. And black played the immediate bishop d7. I think it's worthwhile saying that black retreats this bishop to give himself the option of at some point reinforcing the knight on e4 with f7 f5. This is quite an important trump for black, and you'll see it enacted in this game. Stoll played b3, and black played e6, hitting the knight. Stoll played knight e3. Now in his notes of the game, in place of knight e3, he gives knight f4. And then he says that black should play f5, intending g5 with a kingside initiative. After knight e3, black reinforces knight with f5. Bishop b2, and black played g5. Now white played knight c2. And then came bishop e8 planning to activate the bishop on either g6 or h5. White played knight d2, and black played bishop g6. Now Stoll played e3. Well, I think the best move for black here is to continue the reinforcement of the knight with d5, after which I think black's game is very playable. If white plays f3, then knight takes d2, queen takes d2, and we've got a kind of Dutch formation where black's well placed on the king's side, got a firm foothold in the centre, and I believe he's got full equality here. Back now to the position after bishop f5. 
and White can try and push Black around a bit with the aggressive move d5. This is a strong, interesting move, and Black has to be on the ball to guard against it. Firstly, he has to play Knight a5, which attacks White's c pawn. And then there are two moves for White. The best move, I think, is Knight d4. And we're going to follow the game Barkser versus Kufeld, Leningrad 1967. The first point of Knight d4 is that it sets a trap. If black now takes on c4, knight takes c4, white plays knight takes f5, g takes f5, and then queen d3, forking the knight on c4 and the pawn on f5, with a very strong position. Black certainly should not allow that to happen. So much better after knight d4 is the calm retreat, bishop d7, preparing c5, ousting white's knight from the center. Barks are played b3. Now there is an alternative here. Um, for instance, if we replace b3 with queen d3, we get the game Quella against Stein, Seuss 1967. But black got tremendous counter play after that, with c5, knight b3, and the very interesting move, b5, along the lines of the Benko Gambit. Coella played, knight takes a5, queen takes a5, knight takes b5, bishop takes b5, c takes b5, a6. b takes a6, and then rook f b8, bishop d2, queen takes a6, with sufficient pressure along the a and b files, and in fact black went on to win. Back now to Barks de Kufeld, where white played b3, and now c5 happened. White took on c6, and black took back with a b pawn. Bishop b2, rook b8, threatening, knight takes on c4. White protected his bishop on b2 with queen d2, and then came c5, knight d b5, knight c6, knight d5, knight takes d5, Bishop takes g7, King takes g7, Bishop takes d5, and here in this equal position, I decided to spice the game up a bit by sacrificing a pawn, knight b4. Well, Barks have decided to bite, knight takes a7, and then Kane, knight takes d5, Queen takes d5, Queen c7, Knight b5, Bishop takes Knight, Pawn takes Bishop, Rook takes b5. Well, fans of the Benko Gambit will know just how difficult it is for White to attack this type of black pawn chain. All the pawns connected. The backward ENF pawns well away from White's major pieces, and Black all ready to initiate pressure down the open A and B files, with, for instance, a move like Rook A8 at some point. We'll just take the game on a few more moves to illustrate why Black has slightly better chances here. White went Rook FC1, and Black played Queen B7. White wing queen d2, and now black piled on the pressure down the files with rook a8. White went rook to c3, and black played king g8, getting his king out of the way. Rook a c1, and black played rook a3. 
rook 1 to c2, and then rook b to a5. Now, objectively, this position is probably a draw, although it's extremely difficult for white to defend. In fact, white lost this game. You'll find the game in the booklet. White went on to lose in 48 moves. But you can't deny that here, black has all the pressure, and that's exactly what we're looking for in this line. Returning to the position after knight a5, the less aggressive way to handle the position with white, but probably the move you'll most encounter in your own games, is knight d2. The point is white simply protects the pawn and threatens to expand with e4. We now follow the game Yusupov Gulko, Reykjavik, 1990, where black played a good move here, c6. No point in being too convoluted about it, just attack the white centre. Also setting a little trap by black, because if white now plays b4, which looks like it wins the black knight, then comes knight takes d5, exclamation mark. Uncovering an attack against the knight on c3, and if white plays knight takes d5, then the simplest for black is c takes d5 with a double attack. The knight on a5 and the pawn on d5 hit the pawn on c4. The obvious attack is the bishop on g7 against the rook on a1. So black's knight escapes a death sentence. Back at the game, Yusupov played e4. And black played bishop g4. A nice little probing move, hoping to get f3 out of white. When the bishop just drops back to d7, hoping to claim that f3 is a weakening move. Anyway, Yusupov wasn't having any of that, and he played queen c2. Then came c takes d5, c takes d5, and the normal move, rook c8, hoping to profit from the fact that the knight on c3 is pinned against the queen. White played rook e1, and black played b5. And I think, in general, the opening's been quite satisfactory for black. He threatens b4, he's got pressure along the c-file, and his pieces, although slightly scattered, the knight on a5, for instance, has come back into the game straight away with knight c4. A quiet line for white, but one which black must play accurately against, is b3 here. Black plays the usual knight e4, and after bishop b2, we get the familiar set up knight takes c3, bishop takes c3, and then bishop e4. Two moves have been played here, neither of which give black too many difficulties. The first of these is queen d2, and then play should go e5, d5, knight e7, knight e1, bishop takes g2, knight takes g2, queen d7, e4, f5, with a comfortable game for black. For instance, in the game Krogius Gufeld, USSR Championship 1967, white went e takes f5, g takes f5, f4, and then knight g6 maintained a good game for black. Instead of queen d2, white may try rook c1, probably a slightly better move, but I think the same recipe should be applied by black. Let's play e5 here. And then go on as follows. d5, knight e7. And now, if white wants any advantage at all in this position, he has to play bishop h3 here. Now, the point of this unusual move is to try and take profit of the position of black's bishop on e4. White intends to retreat his knight for instance to d2, force the black bishop away, and then try and chase it around. For instance, if the bishop goes to f5, white simply drops back to g2 with his bishop, threatening e4, with tremendous gain of space. So, black's got to be on the ball against bishop h3. 
Now, probably the best move here is the immediate bishop f5. Although, bishop takes f3, e takes f3, f5 may also be playable. But after bishop f5, theory runs bishop takes f5, knight takes f5, e4, knight e7, c5. with the books giving white having a slight initiative. Not so sure about this, because I think black should aim for f5 as quickly as possible. So not the immediate f5, because of knight g5. But if black plays h6, this position, threatening f5, then I think he can count on a reasonable game. For instance, h6. White takes on d6. C takes d6. Black recaptures. C takes d6. Queen e2. Queen d7. Rook c2. f5. And I assess this position as level. A final attempt by white to force through the move e4 is knight e1. Against this move, I recommend queen c8, with the idea that if white goes e4, then black plays bishop h3. Now, in virtually all the games which I've seen in this line, white has played knight c2. And now there are two ways for black to handle the position. There's an old way and a new way. The old way was seen in Bronstein Cycling, 39th USSR Championship 1971, where black played a kind of cagey strategy. Cycling went rookie 8, and Bronstein played f3. Then Cycling played a6, bishop e3, Rook b8, intending maybe to go b5. White stopped this with queen d3. And then black played bishop takes g2, king takes g2. Probably around here, white is a little bit better, although black has chances against the centre with, for instance, a move like e5. Although it's difficult to see him organising the move f5 for some time to come. So that's the cagey way to play the position, but it's probably slightly better for white. Now I think a better way to play this position with, with black was seen in the game Saloff versus PK, Vikings A, 1991, where after knight c2, black played more directly. Bishop takes g2, king takes g2, and then directly e5, rather than waste time on rook e8. Saloff BK went d5, knight e7, and then queen e2. Well, after queen e2, black got on with the business of preparing f5. He played knight d7. White played f3, and black played a5. He could have played f5 immediately. Saloff played bishop g5 a kind of disruptive move, and black went rook e8, bishop e3, b6, white played b3, and finally black got around to playing f5. White played a3. Now obviously in this game white's chances lie on the queen side, and with a3 he prepares the move b4 trying to open things up there. Black should counter white's pressure on the queen side by trying to initiate an attack on the king side. Therefore, after a3, black played king h8. 
Now, the main idea of King H8 is to play Knight G8. The rationale is that the Knight on E7 isn't doing very much. It'd be much better placed on F6. For instance, the manoeuvre Knight G8 to F6 could easily happen, and then Black can maybe consider bringing his Knight out to H5, trying to put pressure on the White King side. So King H8, and Seloff went straight through with B4. Now there's no threat to take on A5 immediately. I think if that happened, Black would be delighted to capture with the Rook. So he played Knight G8. And White went Rook A, B1. Well now that the Rook has left the A file, PK took on B4. A takes B4. Um, A takes B4. And black went knight g f6. White played queen d3. And black played rook f8. Now if white takes twice on f5, for instance e takes f5, g takes f5, queen takes f5, then black will respond with the discovery, knight takes d5 attacking white's queen. So after rook f8, white went bishop g1, and black went knight h5, after which the game was completely unclear. Black certainly has chances on the king's side. Summing up, I recommend the move bishop f5 against the Fianchetto variation. It's interesting and little played. If you study the information on this video, you'll have an undoubted advantage against most of your opponents, who won't really know much theory on the line. Perhaps the most critical line of all for white is where he plays knight e1, and hopes to force through the move e4. But if you remember to play queen c8, and then e4, bishop h3, followed by taking on g2, and a quick e5, I believe that even here, in the most critical line, black can work up a good game. I think you'll agree that this repertoire is both individualistic and interesting. Black gets good chances to secure the initiative without falling foul of the theory merchants. That can't be underestimated. I can promise you more of the same on video two.